So hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to my talk on how to cultivate psychological safety in the context of site reliability management. So just a little bit of background on me. I'm a senior engineer at Teachers Pay Teachers. Over the course of my career, I've been on many tech and engineering teams, and each of these teams was unique in its own way. Each had its own way of doing things, its own unique set of problems. But in spite of the complexity that each of these teams had, two things always seem to remain true. The first is that teams always perform better when they feel psychologically safe. I'm sure this isn't surprising, right? Psychological safety is actually something we talk about somewhat frequently now in tech, um, especially since the pandemic started, right? But what I really wanna emphasize here is that psychological safety is even more important for site reliability engineering because of the nature of the work, right? Every engineer has at least one story of a time that they took down production or deleted some database, right? Uh, and the reason we remember those so vividly, right, is because they were stressful at the time, especially if they happened when we were less senior. So incident management, right, is stressful, which is why SRE focused teams need to be particularly thoughtful about building psychological safety um, in their environments. As a tech lead, uh, the embedded SRE model was something I thought about a lot so I'll spend the rest of our time reviewing the principles and practices I've found to be effective for uh, reliability focused teams. Now, before I do that, um, oops, sorry, switched on that. Uh, so before I do that, let me take a step back and talk about how I came to develop my style of leadership and management as well. So I mentioned previously how I've worked at the Google for Education org and Teachers Pay Teachers. But even before that, I worked at another small ed tech startup did computational research focused on the education sector, worked as an analyst in the education uh, nonprofit space, and spent hundreds of hours of my spare time tutoring, teaching, and mentoring students. So I've been thinking about education pretty much my entire career. And one of the reasons for that is because I've always been obsessed with this idea that education should be a place where students are empowered to learn and become their best selves. And one of the reasons for that um, and well, so many years ago, rather, I encountered this idea of like trauma-informed education or trauma-informed teaching, which is basically just a methodology that considers how trauma impacts learning and behavior in the classroom. And this approach resonated deeply, right? As someone who is a woman of color in the United States where we face the daily trauma of racist patriarchy, and as someone who's like pretty purposeful about working on teams that don't just look like the, Sil the cast of Silicon Valley. And so when I think about building psychological safety teams, I come from an approach influenced by the principles of trauma-informed education. Now, trauma-informed education actually has seven core principles, but I'm gonna just focus on three uh, that influence my approach the most. So first we have that psychological safety is created by building trust through respect, acceptance, and transparency. What this means practically is that the expectations of our teams and culture should be clear, right? We should strive for standard practices while making it clear that mistakes and failure are inevitable consequence of engineering and of being people. And this is why blameless postmortem culture right, is so important for SRE teams, right? It allows us to embrace risk while having a process in place to learn from mistakes and failure. Secondly, the importance of empowerment, voice, and choice, right? Trust isn't built within a team and then assumed to be had forever, right? Trust needs to be maintained continuously. And a winning strategy for that is to continuously empower folks to raise challenges and issues because they know that they, they'll be addressed or even feel empowered to address these issues themselves. And we'll talk more about this later, but engineering is all about feedback loops, right? So ultimately this comes down to taking those feedback loops seriously. And lastly, we have inclusion. The psychological safety of everyone on the team needs to be a top priority and harm and bias should never be tolerated, right? We build our culture with the most vulnerable people in mind first, because when we build for the most vulnerable people in mind first, we're way more likely to end up building for everyone in mind. All right, so, so far I focused on the importance of psychological safety and some principles behind that, but I did mention that there were two things that always remain true for every team I've worked on. And the second, is that chronic problems are the most common threat to psychological safety. And what I mean by this is that chronic problems threaten psychological safety by eating away at your team's ability to be resilient, to change, and more importantly, failure. And the longer chronic problems go unaddressed, the more you risk burning out even some of the strongest teams, 
And so what do I actually mean when I say chronic issue, right? It's kind of an ambiguous term. Um, so let's characterize it further. So there are two main characteristics that I think distinguish chronic issues. The first is that these issues are repetitive or long, uh, long lasting, right? Think of any team or any community even that you've been a part of now, right? Um, if you've been on that team or community long enough, you can probably quickly identify some issues that came up over and over again, right? And the severity of these chronic issues does vary widely, but each of them poses some risk to your culture. At worst, right, they are those services or tools that break painfully off often, so your on-call is always getting paged. Um, at best, right, they are those flaky end-to-end -end tools or tests that you keep ignoring because they pass on retry, but in the back of your mind, you know you should probably dig into it before it makes it before it comes back to bite you in the butt. And so the second is that these problems tend to be very difficult to solve. This is usually part of why they become chronic in the first place. But this is also part of why they're so important to solve because chronic issues are some of the biggest indicators of complexity and organizational dysfunction. And site reliability engineering teams, right? We deal with chronic issues all the time, right? We'll talk about this more later, right? But for SRE teams, chronic issues often manifest themselves as toil, for example. Now let's tie these back to our principles from earlier, right? How do chronic issues impact our ability to hold true to our to hold true to our principles? So starting with trust, acceptance, and transparency. When something is around for so long that you can depend on it to happen again, and it's something that as a culture or as a team, you've collectively considered an issue, that probably means some shared value or principle is being violated, right? Maybe it's more on the simpler side, like your code base is being chronically under-tested and that pattern being an indicator that folks aren't meeting your org's definition of production-ready code. Or maybe it's something more severe, like that person who keeps saying things they shouldn't, and yet no one says anything despite claiming that we all care about diversity. These situations, these types of situations, make people lose trust in your team's ability to hold truth to your values and its ability to handle any conflict. Secondly, chronic issues directly impact the team's sense of empowerment, right? Again, when an issue is allowed to go on for so long, especially when there's no action being taken, right? People are going to be left feeling unheard and like they're unable to do anything about the situation they're in. Right, this becomes some kind of acquired help, hopelessness that is ultimately never really healthy for any team. And lastly, chronic issues are also inclusion issues because chronic issues are felt by the most vulnerable people first. And so in other words, right, the flaws of an organization are always felt by your most vulnerable employees first. Furthermore, bias is a chronic issue itself. Right, even the healthiest cultures have bias embedded in them. So when I asked you earlier to think of a chronic issue, right, if you couldn't come up with one, this is the first one you can start with because I guarantee that this is a chronic issue for someone. So how do you make sure that chronic problems don't kill your culture, right? Like where are the points of intervention? And so I define generally three approaches to intervening with chronic issues. The first is preventative. The second is proactive. And the last, which is the one we want to avoid at, as much as possible, is reactive. The preventative approach requires you to design processes and systems that prevent these problems in the first place, right? You obviously won't be able to prevent all your problems this way, but it can reduce the number of problems and also keep your team focused on harder problems that will mature your team or organization quicker, right? We should always expect to be solving problems, but ideally, the problems you're solving are different or new problems. And so to do that, we have to weigh, we have to have a way of monitoring the health of our team or organization. And so these are the feedback loops I mentioned earlier, and they can take many different forms, but the point is that we should make it easy to find patterns that serve as input for short-term and long-term improvements by building robust feedback loops. And so feedback loops, right, their, their function is ultimately to communicate pain, pain points throughout the team, right? And this is important, again, going back to our principles for ensuring that people are being heard. And so I started off this talk by saying, you know, embracing risk and planning for failure is a tenet of creating psychological safety, right? Again, problems will rise and it's inevitable. But the upfront investment that you put into building robust feedback loops will drive your team towards being in a preventative state instead of a reactive one.
Next, you should be strategic about how your team prevents chronic issues from happening in the first place. Going back to our feedback loops, right? We should constantly be learning from these feedback loops. Otherwise we're underutilizing them, right? And over time, we should be building our team's collective knowledge of how to build or how to manage liability effectively and build excellent software. And this is you know, important for morale because you know, people feel good when they produce excellent work, right? Like no one actually really likes shipping bad code. Um, and this is why my style of engineering tends to lean more heavily on the design and the production readiness phases of engineering. Now, I know we have to, having worked on product engineering teams, um, so especially on those for the teams that are more on the embedded SRE side, right? We do have to balance time, right? With being able to ship quickly. So when I think, when I say this, I think everyone's first instinct is to kind of like hold their breath and because they think I mean, I like to run my team slowly, but I've always found the opposite to be true, right? We invest early so that we don't have to run backwards after releasing a feature that ended up not being production ready. And the most successful projects I've seen that, yes, were delivered on time, uh, were ones where a lot of thought was put into the technical design and production readiness parts of building software, because they ultimately made development a lot more smoother and built confidence for when we did ultimately end up releasing. And when you're not in this road, right, it, uh, in this kind of mode, it's, it is hard to get there, right? It involves a degree of trust that the time you, invest, you invest more upfront will pay off later. So when I first introduced this way of engineering to one of my teams, uh, I did hear a lot of concerns about this, right? Especially from cross-functional uh, folks who were more concerned with deadlines. So for folks who are on teams that feel like rushing is causing a lot of your production problems, but feel stuck in that cycle of rushing, just choose one project to try this out on and see how it goes. And if it goes well, use that model as a, as a use that model for driving longer term change. Now, this long-term approach has to be complemented with the short-term approach as well, right? Because inevitably our long-term strategy will fall through from time to time. Which is why having a strategy for how you hold your team accountable itself um, to itself is important. And these strategies or frameworks should be transparent and aligned with your core uh, principles, right? Decision-making shouldn't be happening in a silo and your teams should feel like they're part of the process. Luckily, the tech, the tech industry has come up with a solution to this need, which are service level objectives and error budget policies. SLOs or service level objectives, right? They introduce transparency by defining reliability targets, right? It clarifies our collective expectations around what reliability experience we should be providing users. And when you couple these with error budget policies, which essentially define the measures we take when we do stop, when we stop meeting those expectations, right? SLOs introduce an extra layer of accountability that will make your teams more resilient to failure. Now, let's talk about a very common source of support, a uh, source of pain rather for uh, teams and that's on-call. Uh, most engineers I know, right, don't look forward to on-call. Incident management, like I said earlier, right, can be stressful. Um, especially if the state of your own call shifts are best described as utter chaos. But that shouldn't be the case, right? If your engineers dread your on-call shift, that means the state of your on-call is unhealthy. And noise isn't the only source of pain for on-calls. It's an unfortunately very common pattern um, or expectation for on-call engineers to balance the work of on-call with their long-term project work. And I think this is a completely an entire pattern. Um, not only do I think it's fair, but I, it also introduces instability to your roadmap, right? If you're depending on engineers to make progress in the context of a deadline. So because of this, I prefer to avoid this tension altogether by having what I call dedicated on-call shifts. And so what I mean by this uh, is that instead of forcing your on-call engineers to bounce both on-call and long-term project work, reinforce our empowerment principle by empowering the engineers on call to take ownership over how they spend their time on call outside of incidents, right? And this is things like working on eliminating toil or doing some other improvements to your services, right? This not only relieves the stress of needing to manage incidents and project work at the same time, but it also communicates a trust in your teammates that uh, they can help make on call better over time, right? By providing a steady avenue for them to solve problems, the problems that bother them most. And the reason I don't consider this as part of the long-term strategy or approach is because you know you won't be able to only you won't be able to solve all your 
issues with your dedicated on-call process. Right, not every issue or improvement will be able to fit into the on-call shift, but it is an additional layer of reassurance that I found really powerful, um, especially in terms of keeping your team accountable to itself. Lastly, it shouldn't just be one leader holding a team accountable, right? By falling into that pattern, you're introducing a huge dependency on that leader, right? Instead, what you really wanna form is a strong leadership core. Right. At the very least, this is a TL and an EM, right, for our more pure like platform engineering, uh, site reliability engineering teams. For more like embedded models or any product engineering teams, right, it tends to be classic EM or TL, PM designer, et cetera. And like even in the case of your org um, or team not being that large, right, we should still find ways to reduce your team's dependency on leaders, right? Maybe that means your team has strong relationships with their skip levels or some other org or some other leader in the org. Ultimately, the goal here is to promote a sustainable leadership model for your team or organization. One where power is distributed so that leaders can use each other's strengths to serve the shared goal of building excellent, healthy teams. A leadership core also introduces a source of support for each other, right? Leaders don't have to refine their leadership skills and take on this work alone, right? Share, we should be sharing what works with each other and share responsibility while holding each other accountable. Now let's switch to the proactive state. So in the proactive state, a potentially chronic problem has emerged, but it hasn't caused significant problems yet, right? We obviously don't want them to get worse though. So because we have, we, because we proactively monitor for early indicators, we can address issues before they have long-term impact. I mentioned earlier that the most vulnerable people in an organization or any community really are the first ones to feel dysfunction, right? So part of having robust feedback loops is making sure that they are able to capture these perspectives, right? Dig into the granularity of your team makeup, right? Because different issues will affect different people or affect them differently. But what that doesn't mean, right, is that they aren't just as important. And so also focus on making the feedback actionable. That way, when you revisit your processes, you can iterate to address pain points because problems will arise and success isn't only determined by the problems you avoid, right? It's also judged by how you iterate on feedback in areas of improvement. Your initial solutions might not end up working. And instead of focusing, instead of forcing your team to accommodate the process, right? Adjust the process to accommodate the needs of your team. Having worked for companies with tons of bureaucracy, I've seen way too many processes be a source of harm instead. And so even though we should always be looking for new areas of improvement, obviously, right, it's also okay and honestly even essential that you celebrate the progress you do make, right? Show gratitude for the ways that, you know, your team step up, for the way that people show that they care about preserving psychological safety for the rest of the team. So a lot of us probably have some form of a retro, right, either maybe general team retros or project specific retros. Um, even incident, you know, postmortems, right, make space for explicit celebration, right? Revisit your pre-mortems to see what risk you identified but, not, but ended up not happening. Celebrate the wins that did happen when you were managing an incident. Lastly, there is the reactive approach. At this point, the chronic issue has already had a negative impact on your team or organization. And you might actually even be in a, in a position where you're kind of forced into addressing it. And so once you've reached that state, once you've reached this state, right, um, that an issue becomes a chronic issue, it becomes a lot harder to solve. And it also becomes a lot harder to restore your team's sense of safety or happiness. Because at this point, your team has probably lost trust in its leaders, your, the organization in general, and even worst case scenario, right, also each other. Now, instead of taking this moment as a signal to make change happen, what I often see, in, what I often see instead are a lot of anti-patterns happening. Right. More specifically, I see organizations come to rely on acts of hero heroism until people reach the point of burnout. And when I say heroism and burnout here, I'm not just referring to the type of burnout we tend to focus on, which is overworking, right? You know, working long hours, um, working weekends, et cetera. I'm also referring to the type of emotional burnout that happens when someone is in an environment that is unhealthy, whether that's something like constant underappreciation because you're so focused on the work that you forget to show each other gratitude or appreciation, 
or something more severe like dealing with bias or harassment, right, in the name of a learning lesson for the folks causing harm. So it goes without saying, heroism and burnout are not effective strategies for organizational failures. Because ultimately that's what we're asking of people when, we're, when we put them in that situation, when they're put in that situation, right? To make up for organizational failures by sacrificing their well-being. And just because someone is willing to be, in hero, uh, be a hero doesn't mean we should take them up on that offer, right? Heroism is a sign, it's a sign of bad culture, not good hiring outcomes. And so let's expand on the cultural and organizational consequences of heroism some more. So the first is that heroes prevent true progress because they're band-aids to, system, to systemic issues. And they do this by putting off the hard work of actually addressing um, our problems, our root causes, our contributing factors. And kind of like tech debt, right? It might be effective in the short term, um, but it's not an effective long-term strategy, right? Eventually you have to pay that tech debt back. And the way we pay that back, right, as we just said, tends to be in the form of burnout. And not only is this awful for the people who have to experience this, but it's also awful for our organizations, right? We all know how hard it is to, to hire and retain people these days, right? Like, we don't want to give them additional reasons to leave. And if you're in a situation where your only choice is to engage in heroics, right, push to say no anyway. And if you're still forced into engaging in uh, forced into engaging with heroics, that's probably an indicator of some deeper cultural issues. In this situation, the way I approach is by um, I approach it is by a actively asking for consent and providing a way of rewarding people who step up. I was in the Google for Education org when schools went remote um, first in the beginning of the pandemic. Pretty much everyone who wasn't immediately directly impacted by the pandemic in that work engaged in heroics of some form in that for those first few weeks, right? We had scaled from 45 million users to 130 million users in the course of two months. So of course, right, people had to step up. And it was something that we absolutely could not have predicted. So, but the one silver lining here was that my manager, the leadership of the org, right, did do right by us by one, asking you know, for active consent, asking if it was okay, and two, being direct upfront about how we'd be rewarded for it, right, in the form of additional compensation or additional time off, etc. And so, you know, again, while it's not ideal to ask this of your team, and you should absolutely use this strategy lightly, right, this is a way of managing some of the risk that comes with engaging in this kind of behavior. But again, you know, ideally only when things like pandemics happen, so. And lastly, the impact of heroism isn't distributed equally. It looks different depending on your personhood, right? When, over, when overrepresented people present themselves as heroes in the workplace, right? They're, impressed, they're embraced as such and they're more likely to be rewarded. But when underrepresented people represent themselves as heroes in the workplace, a lot of times it's not even seen that way, right? Instead, it feels more like the default expectation of how people, of how underrepresented people are supposed to perform just to justify their existence in tech. So in other words, right, heroism for others is what merely existing is for a lot of underrepresented people. And this is what we mean, I don't know if you've ever heard the phrase, but of uh, when underrepresented people say like, we have to work two times as hard to get half the recognition, right? It ultimately leads, it's ultimately pointing to the fact that we don't have the privilege of choice as much as overrepresented folks do. And the second part of this third consequence here is that heroism often leads to disproportionate power between teammates. Earlier, I said how leaders should reduce the team's dependency on themselves, right? And this really applies to anyone in a team or organization, right? Heroism is dangerous because it redistributes power by putting people in a position where they have to depend on heroes, right? This is part of why that having that leadership core is important. Right? When a team or org becomes so dependent on one person, especially when they're a leader, it can start to feel like they're untouchable or like they're incapable of doing any harm or being held accountable. So what do we do when we do get here? Unfortunately, I'm here to deliver some obvious but hard truths, right? When a team reaches the state, leaders are the ones who are responsible for the organizational failures that got them there. Right, blameless postmortem culture does not apply to leadership. In fact, crucial the crucial part of blameless postmortem culture is that you shift towards identifying the systemic reasons that cause the problem. And so, while blameless postmortem culture might not agree that 
leaders are at fault for these issues. Blameless postmortem culture definitely agrees that leadership is responsible for them. And this is, I think, the thing I see leaders struggle with more than anything else, right? It can be really hard to reconcile the fact that most of the problems you have to solve or work on aren't, direct, aren't directly your fault, but that they are your responsibility. But ironically, as much as we don't want to cast, cast blame and whatnot, it's when we ignore our responsibilities as leaders that issues actually start to become our fault. So here's another hard truth, right? Sometimes that person is you. Sometimes you or your leadership core are those leaders, right? And the onus is on those leaders to take responsibility. And sometimes what responsibility looks like is holding whoever's leadership to us accountable in the ways that we have access to. But it's just as important to recognize the role that we play in organizational failures. Because the higher up in leadership you are, right, the more your flaws have the potential to scale across your organization. And so if you're a leader, use whatever access you have to action on that responsibility. Sometimes, you know, as leaders, we do have to be strategic about when to use that privilege, especially for folks who are more underrepresented in tech. But generally speaking, most people tend to underestimate and underutilize the privilege of leadership in the context of leadership, but also in the context of the world generally. Now, I've thrown the word responsibility around a lot, but given no direction on what that looks like. So um, let's roll ahead next. Taking responsibility is wildly complex, right? But I think the approach can be condensed into three steps, three steps roughly. The first is to admit where you went wrong, right? Admit the role that you let it play, that, admit the role that you played in this. Admit that you might have let it get this way. The people you lead will actually appreciate you a lot more for being vulnerable about where you went wrong, especially when you follow up with action, right? Because psychological safety, right, is about feeling safe to make mistakes while trusting that you're in an environment that seeks to minimize psychological harm through accountability. And this is the core of what it really means to be trauma-informed, right? It's not, it's not just about feeling safe that we as individuals can make mistakes. It's also about preserving safety in spite of the mistakes that inevitably end up happening. Which is why the second step of taking responsibility is centering the folks impacted. All right, this is where leaders really need to practice empathy, right? Who was harmed in the process? Who had to step up as a hero or a leader because you didn't, right? Thank them, reward them, ask them what they need to build, rebuild trust. You might not always be able to provide what they need, and sometimes it might even be too late, but at least they will feel heard. And lastly, there are the actual changes you follow up with. So that means revisiting the preventative and proactive measures that you have in place, the ones we talked about before, right? You should be asking the question, where did our processes fail to get us here? And depending on the situation, right, you might also have to make some really tough decisions. And this is really hard, but it's also really crucial, right? We should absolutely make space for mistakes and growth, right? No one is disp disposable. I've said that plenty of times, I think, at this point. But serious starts to psychological safety of your team or even individual people aren't a trade-off that we should just be making lightly, right? Leadership is earned and not owed continuously because just like the flaws of an organization are felt, are felt by our most vulnerable coworkers first, so are the flaws of our leaders. And so one final note, I know none of this is easy, right? Like everything I said is pretty much easier said than done. Um, my hardest moments as a team or a tech lead were ones where I had to deal with these types of complex issues, right? And everyone and every single one does kind of take a little bit out of you, right? But that's the price we pay for the privilege of leadership. And as leaders, for those of us who are leaders, we should never lose sight of that privilege, right? The privilege to cultivate culture, to cultivate community in a way that achieves excellence without sacrificing people along the way. In a world where that's so unfortunately common, right? Choose to bring this energy, this way of thinking in all the ways that you have access to. Trust me, that is hard or as frankly scary as it might be, right? Having been on the side where my access to that was minimal, the heartache that comes with leadership is still one of the best privileges I've ever had. So be grateful for that privilege and be honest with yourself about where you're struggling, right? This is why conferences like these exist, right? To refine the craft that goes into being an engineer into being a good leader. And those things can be very lonely, right? But it doesn't have to be for our sake and the sake of the people we have the privilege of leading. Thank you.